So uh, I was challenged to talk about AWS in 15 minutes, which is a very challenging request considering the breadth and the depth of all the different services and all the different topics you could talk about. So I thought the most effective way uh, or the most productive way we could have this talk is to, for you guys to walk away at least being conversant in different terms. Um, so when going back to the customer site, you would at least have uh, an awareness of several of the terms. So um, before we start, picture yourself in a meeting. You're on the government site. You're talking with your government PM, uh, maybe sysadmin, and maybe the lead architect. And they're in the meeting. They're throwing around AWS terms. And you're mental noting, I'm going to think about, uh, like, I, I got to Google these terms when I get back to my desk. But just then, they turn to you and ask, what do you think? And how do you respond? So, um, so most of the governments uh, it's in a lot of the commercial world are turning to cloud. Um, it's very important to know some of the general concepts of why they're going to cloud. So we'll look at that first. Um, most of you guys already know this, but just a quick review. Uh, some of the benefits. They are really focused on uptime. And they can promise uh, um, uptime a lot higher uh, guarantee than, than your project will. And they also do a replication across several different data centers. I've been on several big projects, and never once have we actually had multiple locations uh, deployed in multiple, multiple locations. You don't have to plan for capacity several months out. You can, if you need to scale quickly, you can scale quickly. But the big one that the customers are, are concerned about is the fact that they don't have to buy several hundred thousand dollar servers planning out for the next year of capacity. And during waiting for that year of capacity to come, if they only have five users for six months, you're only paying for five users worth of infrastructure. You don't have to pay for what you plan out a year from now. And then lastly, when Amazon goes to buy hard drives, they're buying it several orders of magnitude in bulk more than your project will. Um, and so they can pass those savings on to you. So now I was going to talk about some of the terms. And I thought the best way to do this is start out with a traditional web app, uh, architecture. So this is web application architecture. And it's just going to go through here and replace these components one by one looking at the ADOS equivalent. The good news is for most of these terms, you already know the concepts. It's just learning the terminology for them. So first off, uh, in here, um, you may have your VMs, your virtual machines that are running your Tomcat, are running your solar cluster. Um, in AWS, those are EC2 instances. Uh, EC2 instances act just like other virtual machines. You build, you create them, destroy them on the fly, treat them as cattle, don't treat them as pets. Um, <laughs> and uh, very tightly coupled to that is uh, EBS. Uh, EBS volumes are basically your removable disk drives that attach to your virtual machines. They give you the flexibility of you set up your disk volume, and then if you need to grow your instance, you blow away your instance, create a larger one with more RAM, more CPU, and then reattach your EBS volume to it. And then uh, you may have a load balancer that distributes traffic across your cluster. And AWS, that's your ELB. It behaves just like you would expect um, a load balancer to happen. Next, you may have an admin page. Uh, that allows your administrator to bring virtual machines up, take it down, kind of like a vSphere client in VMware. And AWS, that's the AWS console. Next, you may have uh, a roles page that allows your administrators to manage different accesses and roles. And AWS, that's uh, your identity access management. And IAM also controls user policies and uh, services. Um, so. You can set that some EC2 instances can have read-only access to certain buckets or certain things. And then EC, some EC2 instances can only write. So different services can actually have different permissions inside your cloud. Next, auditing, of course. And AWS, that's CloudTrail is the service they provide. And CloudTrail only logs the different management of their services. So if someone takes down a virtual machine, takes down an EC2 instance, it would log that. Um, it doesn't log necessarily what goes on inside your EC2 instance. Next, uh, your mail notification system and AWS, uh, you, can, uh, you can use SNS for that. And SNS actually provides not just email notifications, but also text and even a Apple and Android notifications. Um, it can push them out to your administrators or even your users. So that's kind of uh, some of the um, front end and administrative different uh, services. Uh, let's look at some of the back end. So, Again, you'd have your virtual machine cluster, and you'd replace that with EC2 and EBS. You may have a queuing service like ActiveMQ that sends messages, allows you to share messages between your different servers, services. 
And AWS, that's SQS, very simple. And then you may have a um, in-memory cache database that maybe caches queries for your relational database so that you can just instantly return results. You don't have to go all the way down to the database. And AWS, that's uh, provided by ElastiCache. And ElastiCache, you can even choose which engine. You can either choose Redis or MCached for the underlying engine. And then next for the database, they provide RDS. And RDS, uh, similarly, you can choose between six different underlying database engines. You can choose uh, between MySQL, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres. Um, they give you several options. Um, next, um, your NoSQL database. Amazon provides DynamoDB. Um, and then, very important, your file store, where you'd be storing your files, is uh, S3. And S3 is a very core component of AWS. <coughs> It's a uh, key store, so it's not a file system. It's, here's a key, give me a file back. Um, it's fantastic for serving static content, but you do not want to run a file system off of it or things that you're rapidly changing. Um, and then your tape archive, um, the equivalent for AWS would be Glacier. And um, Glacier is super cheap to store things long term. However, as the name sounds, it is very, very slow. It can take three to five hours just to get your data out, just to, for your data to become available. And then it's only available for 24 hours. So, um, and it can be very expensive. It gets very expensive if you're pulling lots of data out um, very frequently. So Glacier, you definitely just really want to use your backups. And then lastly, uh, VPC is another very critical component in AWS, and that's the ability to make private clouds and uh, um, private clusters inside your one account. So you can have several different VPCs, and it's a way of logically distingu distinguishing between them. Um, so very often, you'd have a production VPC, a development VPC, test and integration, um, and you can provide or associate different security policies to that as well. So I've talked about several different storage options up here. Um, so I thought it'd be good to kind of compare them um, because Amazon really does provide you with different ones for different scenarios. So here's a little chart showing cost to performance. And to start out with, we'd have your four different EBS volume types. Very straightforward. The more performance you're going to get, the more you're going to pay. Um, the slower it is, the cheaper it is. Um, the default is just your general SSD is uh, what they generally provide you with, um, although most uh, services I've used, uh, just magnetic, and it's been fine. Next is S3, which is a little bit cheaper, a little bit slower. Uh, and Amazon also provides S3 reduced redundancy storage. And this offers the same performance as S3, but they're able to provide it to you a little bit cheaper by the fact that they don't do as much replication on it. Um, so um, it's fantastic for any kind of content that you're generating. So if you're generating thumbnails or you're doing uh, conversion, like converting do Word documents to PDFs, keep the originals on S3 and then do the conversion transformation, save those on S3 RRS. Uh, next, Glacier, which is slowest and the cheapest. Um, and then very recently, uh, it just came out a preview, is Elastic File System. And EFS is basically your NFS uh, cluster. And it uh, provides, it allows you to attach one storage option to several different EC2 instances um, to provide shared storage. But it is 10 times more expensive than normal EBS. And then lastly, uh, many EC2 instances actually come with free storage um, that's included in the EC2 price. Um, however, this instant storage, and, and it's very performant, however, it, uh, it disappears when you terminate the instance. So it's not something you want to do any kind of uh, long-term storage on. Um, it's really just for temporary files. So, um, so speaking of terminating, when talking about creating instances, um, AMIs. AMIs are just images, disk images, that when you create an EC2 instance, you apply um, to the EBS volume to create it. Um, there, there are hundreds to choose from in the uh, AMI marketplace. Um, you can choose anything from bare bones Linux, CentOS, Red Hat, um, even Windows, to all the way to like a uh, pre-configured WordPress, full-fledged WordPress site um, that's just out of the box ready to go. Uh, and then another very, very cool concept is uh, a very cool service is cloud formation. And this allows you to actually script the creation of an entire cloud. And so if you get your VPC production 
up and ready to go. You can script the whole creation of it and you can very quickly deploy to new regions or redeploy your uh, development environment based on what your production environment already is. Um, so I've mentioned a few different terms that start with cloud. Uh, so I thought we'd just compare those real quick. Um, you have CloudFormation, CloudTrail, and CloudWatch, which I haven't mentioned yet. Um, CloudFormation, very simple, it forms clouds. CloudTrail uh, logs your AWS services, and you can remember it by it leaves a trail. And so this is just what's happening around your services. Um, and CloudWatch actually watches the performance inside your services. Um, so things like your CPU usage, how much uh, objects you're actually storing in RDS, and any, any other kind of performance metrics, CloudWatch uh, would provide that for you. So this has been a whole bunch of terms. Um, it's been kind of a fire hose, uh, and there really is a lot more to talk about. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that I wanted to put in and that we were cutting out during, uh, um, while planning for this. So, if, uh, but the good news is we're providing AWS 101 course that's going to go with a lot more in depth. It's going to be very hands-on, um, lots of actually working in AWS to create things, uh, and the, it's only four weeks, which is also great. And uh, um, the big takeaway from it, too, is that you'll actually be able to get two certifications out of this one four-week class. Um, the solutions architect and your developer certification. Um, the exams are about 80% the same, so if you can pass one, you might as well take the other. Um, so that'll be coming sh very shortly in the next few weeks. We'll be sending out an email invitation uh, to everybody uh, to join. Um, so, any questions? Actually, about the uh, cloud formation. Once mm -hmm. you've formed a cloud, can you generate a cloud formation script based on what you already have? I believe you can. Um, and yeah, um, and you can then go back and also tweak it, which is also very powerful. So in our, so in our space, I don't believe you can do that because it requires a certain AMI that's not available. So mm -hmm. you have this thing called CloudFormer, which will actually take your environment and generate the script for you. So when I was working with CloudFormation about a year ago, it wasn't available. However, they do have now the cloud, like there's like a graphical designer that kind of helps with the CloudFormation. Yes. And the other thing I should note, two things. Uh, um, client space obviously doesn't have um, all these services. Uh, I try to get most of the big ones that they do have uh, provided. But um, another good point to make is that if there is stuff that you want, they, they respond by demand. So they're not just bringing, AWS isn't just providing what they want to on the customer site. Um, it's all customer driven. And so they actually have um, Glacier and Redshift up there, uh, which are pretty new ones. Well, at least uh, um, Glacier is, and versus some other older ones they don't have yet. Um, so squeaky wheel, be a squeaky wheel. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is uh, AWS Console is a user interface. It's a web page that's built on top of every API. So um, there are APIs to do a whole bunch of things, and the AWS Console is built on top of it. So you can do everything you can do in the console programmatically through their APIs, which is also very powerful. Any other questions? So I mentioned Redshift, I'll mention that too, is a petabyte scale data warehouse. And so it's great for running analytics on. So if you wanna know how many customers in East Asia versus customers, like how well a product is selling in East Asia versus how much a product is selling, selling in the United States, it's a way to do really uh, complex queries um, on huge amounts of data without uh, bogging down your actual database, production database, which is really nice. It's usually MDM management. Yeah, quick question down for a web developer environment. What sort of machine size would you recommend? Totally depends. Um, so I would actually really recommend starting out small, like T2 micro. <clears throat> so if you guys want, you can already jump on the bandwagon and uh, or, or jump out and try it for yourself. AWS provides a free tier service. So and it's actually pretty decent what you can do for free. Um, and the free EC2 instance they provide is a T2 micro. And it's really, I mean, it's really generous for what you can do. Um, and, and it's very easy. And again, like the whole cattle versus pet concept. So try out a micro. And then if that's not enough, then go ahead and throw up a new one. Um, they also provide several different types of EC2 instances. Uh, they have the general purpose. They have the memory intensive ones. They have CPU intensive. Uh, they even have a GPU intensive. 
and uh, storage density ones, several different types. Uh, maybe you can answer this maybe more for Matt, but what would be recommended if we're going to run like Fidos? What run Fidos? Yeah, what instance? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so an M3 large is recommended. Okay. Uh, has a little more network bandwidth and you're screen scraping across the network. So um, that's, that's recommended. We've seen some people um, who want to move the processing closer to the data. Uh, they'll use a really large instance and then they'll just turn it down. Any other questions?